to open up your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We'll be looking there in just a few minutes. And as you turn there, I wanted to um, let you see here the, uh, that picture actually represents a magnet. And these are magically attracted to uh, refrigerators everywhere. And so if you want one of these, you can. If you don't want one of these, that's all right, too. We won't be offended. But uh, the, uh, we, as we go to Dubai, one of the things that we are most excited about is being a part of a vibrant church. There's very little like um, being able to come on a Sunday morning and worship with other people and uh, to, to trade, swap stories from the week, how the Lord has blessed us or encouraged us or, or lifted us up in a hard time. And uh, really, as we go there, we get to do the same thing at Redeemer Church as many of you do here love one another, listen to one another's stories, and hopefully um, build each other up in the, in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, one of the things that, that we constantly reflect on as Christians is how can we know Christ more? How can we know Christ and make him known? To be a Christian means to, to love Christ, to follow him, to obey him, to be a disciple. And one of the very last things that Jesus said on earth was, you as my disciples will go and make more disciples. You will baptize them in my name and then teach them to obey all that I have commanded you. So to become a Christian, to be a Christian, it is to be a disciple, is to make other disciples. And really, that's what it means to be a missionary. That's what it means to be a missional Christian, is to call other people to discipleship of our Lord Jesus Christ. So whether we do that in, in Ukraine or in Slovenia or in North India or in Dubai, to be a faithful Christian is to love Christ, and is to make him known. Now, for some of you, if you're new to church, if you're new to even if you walked in today, you might think of missions as like this kind of archaic concept, uh, the baggage of colonialism or something like that. And, and really, we as Christians need to even think about that. What does it mean to call people to trust in, in the Lord Jesus Christ? And so at the very heart of it, we're going to see today in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, to, to be a Christian, to be a missionary, is to to make Jesus Christ shine, to shine forth Jesus Christ. And to that end, I want you to remember four things, to think about four things. One is to remember mercy, it is to refuse, to resist, to reject the ways of the world, to recognize that Satan is real, and to rest in God's supernatural work. And so even as we do that, let me pray, and we'll read, we'll read the scripture today. Heavenly Father, we come to you, we want to exalt Jesus Christ, we want him to shine we ourselves recognize, we, we remember how far we were from you, and yet even now, we remember how much you love us in him. And so please teach us by your spirit, I pray. Amen. Chapter 4, verse 1, Paul says, Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But what we have, renou what we have renounced with disgraceful, underhanded ways, we refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves for, as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You know, this morning I want to, with you, remember mercy. Paul said there, we have this ministry by the mercy of God. Well, I want to remember mercy. Mercy is getting what you don't deserve. Or rather, you deserve something, but you don't get it. And really, as Christians, our entire life is filled with mercy. It begins, it continues on, it ends with mercy. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it comes right in the middle of chapters 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. These four or five chapters are devoted to Paul's heart of what does it mean to love the gospel. What does it mean to be a faithful Christian or a faithful church? And right in the middle of it, we, have, we see this passage where Paul starts and says, we have this, this life, this ministry by mercy. And yet, think for, with me for a moment. What if our life, what if salvation, what if knowing Christ, what if obedience and following Jesus, what if it wasn't by mercy? What if it was by what we do? What if it was by our ability, by our personality, by our intentions, by our commitment, or by our faithfulness? 
I tell you, we would be miserable. We would lose heart. Think about your, your, your children, your neighbors. Think about the billion Hindus of India, the 1.3 billion Muslims in the world. We would have no hope. If salvation, if life, if knowing God were based on our own ability. Because you and I, we do not have the ability. And so we come to God, we come to Christ based on his grace, on his mercy. And even as Karen and I go to Dubai, we go there remembering mercy. That we come to him not based on what we deserve. That we serve him not based on what we could earn or merit or procure or, or bring about but rather based on what he's already done. We remember that he's going to continue that which he has started in us. And so I, I don't have to fear. I don't have to lose hope. I don't have to despair. If I look around me and the circumstances around me don't seem to accord with what I see. We sang today that song by Isaac Wardell about the sheaves. We work, we labor, we plant seeds, and then we say, Lord, oh, please, bring the harvest because we remember that it's by mercy. You know, it's not accidental this morning that you've come to Grace Bible. Some of you perhaps have come because it's a habit. It's, um, it's a sense of, of, I belong to this church. I'm a member. I love this place. Some of you perhaps come here out of obligation because you think you have to, some kind of duty. Some of you probably don't even know why you came or how you got here. But I tell you, you came here by God's mercy. You came here not by accident, but because of God's plan. He wanted you to be here to sing these songs, to hear these prayers, to join in intercession with us, to hear the word of God, to break communion, to speak one to another. He wanted you to hear about Christ. And that is mercy. And that is grace. And so we can together say, thank you, Lord. And together we can look to one another and say, do you remember mercy? Because I need to be reminded of it. And perhaps even today, as you walk out of here, you can speak one to another and say, what happened this week in your life that, that reflects God's mercy? What did you experience? Here's what I experienced. And we can, we can encourage one another by what God has done. And so we want to write it out. We want to write it out. How did God work this week? How did he remind me of mercy? And then we want to speak one to another because we forget. And so this morning we want to remember mercy. We also we want to refuse, renounce, reject. You might say three somewhat negative ideas, but we, we see it there in the text. Look back there with me in verse 2. Paul says, We have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in God's sight. Look down at verse 5. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. Now, people of the gospel love holiness, love integrity. We who love Christ, we want to be like Christ, and so we love godliness. And yet it's, it's helpful even as we reflect on that to think about the city of Corinth. Corinth is the city that Paul is writing in this book of 2 Corinthians. Now, in the city of Corinth, you have, to, you have to understand, there was a group of people that loved um, speech-making, rhetoric. They, they loved a professional speaker, like a, a, a cunningly or a cleverly spoken poem. They loved in the city of Corinth, it was, it was like their entertainment. So much like we have pop culture idols or America's Got Talent, they had men and women who could come up to a pulpit or come up to a, a podium and entertain the masses. And everyone would, would just love to give them a standing ovation. And they would give accolade and, and, great, and great money or wealth to those who were really good at making people happy with, with speeches or with poems or a, a, well, a well-spoken story. And so in Corinth, there was this, this love or this affection for people who could speak well. And this, this affection, it infected the church such that the church of Corinth, the people in the church of Corinth, began to love a well-spoken sermon, a carefully articulated or, or cleverly put story. And they, used to, they would begin to exalt these men who could speak well. And some of those men who spoke well began to mock 
and undermine Paul the Apostle. And they said, he doesn't speak very well. He's actually not a very good-looking speaker. He's actually not very clever. And as they began to attack Paul, they began to undermine the gospel and undermine what the local church was all about. And so one of Paul's central points in this book, and especially in this chapter, is to say the gospel is not about cleverness. The gospel is not about a a well-spoken speech that then everyone stands up and says, oh, well done, bravo, bravo. And so Paul wants to say, refuse, reject, renounce. And here he says, this renounce disgraceful and underhanded ways, underhanded ploys, kind of like a tricky speech, ways that massage people's emotions that maybe garner some attention, but that it detracts from the actual content of the message. Uh, it, it's looking at methods. It's looking at the way that we speak. And Paul knew it well. Paul could massage someone's emotions. Paul could whip people up into a frenzy. And he said, no, 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 no. that's not what we do. We proclaim Christ. And we renounce these disgraceful and underhanded ways, the things that the, the Corinthian speechmakers were doing. He also says that we reject some things. You can see it there in the text. Or, uh, he says there in verse 2, we refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. You know, to, to practice cunning or to tamper with something, it, it reminds me of the milkmen in India. So in, at our home in India, the milkman would come and he'd have like a liter or like a half gallon of milk. And you always knew that the milkman added a little water to the milk. Why do you think, why would the milkman add water to the milk? Because it makes, there be, looks like there's a lot more milk there. And then he can sell it to more people. And as he sells it to more people, he makes a little more cash. And so the milkman peddles his milk. And in fact, there's even a phrase, like a statement, a uh, proverb in India, even the milkman drinks watered-down milk, because it's just so common that you tamper with your product to make a little more cash. Paul, the apostle, says, we refuse to peddle God's word. We don't tamper with it. We don't mess with it. We don't play coy or clever. We're not trying to be overly subtle or overly funny. We simply want to straightforwardly speak the word of God over and over and over again. You even see that. Look back at chapter 2, verse 17. Paul says, for we, in verse 17 of chapter 2, he says, we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. And then back in in chapter 4, verse 2, where we were looking before, he says, we refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with his word, but by the open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in God's sight. Yet even as we think about peddling God's word, you know, it's a good question to ask. Why would any self-respecting Christian, or even, you know, why would any church in the world be tempted to peddle God's word? Why would any group of people or family or individual begin to play coy or clever with the words of God? To make it more personal, why would any of you be tempted to make ambiguous something that is clear? Perhaps you have. Perhaps I have. What Paul's addressing here isn't just those people over there in the other church or those people over there in another country like India or Dubai, but perhaps it's right here as well. Because we well know, right, that Jesus says some pretty offensive things. And in fact, if we are accurately speaking what God says in his word and what Jesus Christ says, it's not going to be very popular because Jesus says some pretty unpopular things. One of the parables or the stories that Jesus said often was he he would refer to following him like coming through a gate. And he would say, the road is broad and the way is easy that leads to destruction. But narrow is the gate. Difficult is the road, the way of life. And few there are who find it. 
Well, that was offensive 2,000 years ago. That's going to be offensive today. Jesus Christ said in, in John 3, he said, anyone who believes in me has eternal life. But he who rejects me, who doesn't believe me, on them the wrath of God remains. That's not exactly the way you're going to win friends and influence people. And in fact, Paul knew that, and the church in Corinth knew that, and we know that. And, and so there might be this, this sense in some of you and some of your families, or at Grace Bible, or at other churches here in Bend, this desire to perhaps soften the pointed words of Jesus. You see, there's a timeless, global temptation to soften what Jesus says, to make it sound generous and, and loving and kind, because then perhaps more people will listen. And we do want to present Christ Jesus. We do want people to hear about what Jesus has done for us, because it is glorious and it is wonderful. And yet, there is this in the back of our heads, perhaps, this desire, this temptation to soften what Jesus Christ himself has said. This is true throughout the world. In Lucknow, we met many people who said, yes, I like Jesus, but there are some things he says, those things I don't accept. Well, I, as a follower of Jesus, I, as a disciple of Christ, I follow what Jesus says. You, as followers of Christ, you follow and you obey and you love what Jesus says. And therefore, because we love Jesus and we love his word, we don't peddle it. We don't play coy with it. We don't water it down. We don't become overly nuanced. We speak simply, carefully that which Jesus has said. And we don't give in to the temptation to soften the words of Jesus Christ. I just think, I'm reminded of a friend in India who when he became a Christian after like two years, when he became a Christian, he began to understand what it is that Jesus Christ has saved us from. He began to speak to all of his neighbors, all of his friends, and all of his family. And suddenly, many of his friends, and many of his family, and many of his neighbors stopped talking to him. And he, and he kept pleading with them, no, no, you don't understand. There really is a judgment. There really is wrath coming. And yet, you can be forgiven. You can find forgiveness and cleansing and, and acceptance by the Almighty God. Come and believe. And people didn't really like his message. And yet he kept speaking it. He kept saying it. Because the only way for us to be reconciled to God is through Jesus Christ. And we as his followers, we get to say this to people that they also may be reconciled to God. And we get to say it to people so that they might have life and life everlasting. And so we, as his followers, we speak simply. We speak in the sight of God like Paul. We proclaim Christ, and we don't give in to those temptations. Now, we talk about renouncing underhanded ways. We, we can talk about rejecting uh, cleverness. We also want to talk about resisting or refusing self-aggrandizement or self-promotion. Now, you can see that there in the text where Paul says um, in verse 5, we do not proclaim ourselves. We, what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. Um, again, in, in, uh, in Corinth, those speakers, they were famous for kind of getting themselves mixed up with their message. They would, as they would speak, they would promote themselves. They put themselves on a pedestal. Again, there was a, an economic advantage to it. And so they would desire that people would see themselves as important, as influential, as powerful. And so as people would speak, they would highlight their own accomplishments. They would commend themselves. They would kind of put their, their CV or their resume on display so that everyone could see, I'm good at this. Paul, though, he goes the opposite direction, right? And he leads us in that same way. He leads us to follow Christ as we make much of our smallness. We, we highlight our weakness. Paul actually goes as far as to say that he is like a slave, a bondservant, the lowliest of the lowly, a slave of Jesus Christ. And we ourselves, we want to, we want to direct our attention so much to Christ and so far away from ourselves that we really do begin to decrease 
so that Christ Jesus himself might increase in all that we do. And yet, I got to tell you, this is hard, isn't it? Because our pride gets in the way. We forget. We wake up in the morning, we remember the gospel, we remember how much God loves us and how much God has done for us, and we are humbled and we, are just, we say, thank you, Lord. We praise you and we remember how broken we were and how much he's done. And then the next day we forget. We wake up and we think we've got it all together. And we kind of subtly in the back of our minds walk into a room full of people and we think, yeah, I got it. I'm good. People should respect me. People should think that I've got something to contribute. We make our conversations so often revolve around ourselves. Even like at a, at a Bible study, at a community group, so much of our conversation can reflect my struggles, my prayers, my needs, my, my week, the things that I'm going through. I just wonder, in your relationships with people here at Grace Bible, perhaps in your family, do your thoughts mainly circle yourself? Do the things that you desire, the things as, as you speak with other people, as you talk with neighbors, in the back of your mind, are, are, do, you, do you find yourself subtly putting yourself forward that people might think highly of you, might think better of you? It's a natural temptation because we as humans we continually fight this, this desire to make ourselves known rather than Christ. And isn't Christ good? Isn't his spirit good? He reminds us. He opens our eyes to those subtle ways that we put ourselves forward. He draws us back to himself and says, no, 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 no. It's not about you. It's about me. Perhaps some of you, on the other hand, you perhaps altogether lost the art of conversation. You enter a community group or a Bible study, you're talking with, person, with other people, you don't even know what to say, and so you just say, that's nothing at all, right? Say nothing at all. And, and, and so you have this opportunity to build other people up in Christ or to hear how they're doing, to, to build into them, and for fear of being hurt or perhaps hurting, hurting others, we say nothing at all. But it's not to be like that, right? Because we... As followers of Christ, we join together with other disciples to build each other up so that we might all know Christ and make him known. In all these things, we, we refuse, we reject, we renounce, all because we really do want Jesus Christ to be on display. We really do desire that he would be the center, that he would be the heart, that he would be the focus. And so I just say, I ask you today, are your thoughts primarily about yourself? The things you desire, the things you want, the things that you need? Or are your thoughts incrementally, slowly centering on what others need? On how others may know Jesus? On how others may be built up or served or strengthened? You've got to be relentless with yourself, right? Because, again, we are like that person with short-term memory loss. We forget so easily you know, we had this friend in India uh, named Leslie who was walking, getting on a train several years ago. And as she got onto the train, the train started to move. And she slipped and fell back and hit her head on the train platform. When she came to like a minute later, she couldn't remember what had happened. And so some friends finally got to her and picked her up and they took her home and they put her to sleep because she was kind of out of it. Well, she, she woke up two hours later, couldn't remember anything. So she calls a friend and says, hey, hey, what's going on? I'm so confused. And the friend says, oh, you hit your head on the train platform. We put you to sleep. Go back to bed. Leslie went back to sleep. An hour later, she woke up, totally confused. She calls the same friend. Hey, what's going on? I'm, I'm confused. Where am I? And the friend says, you fell over. You hit your head. You have short-term memory loss. Go back to sleep. An hour later, Leslie wakes up hey, do you know what's going on? The same conversation ensues three more times because Leslie couldn't remember. We are often like that person. We remember and then forget. And then we remember and then we forget. And that's why we need brothers and sisters. That's why we need one another. That's why we need other people to look at us and to say, 
Remember mercy, friend. Remember. Don't forget. We need others to say, don't tamper with God's word. Be faithful to what God has said. That's why we need other people in our lives. Uh, Even a third thing we can see from this passage in verse 4, verse 3 and 4, is we need to recognize that Satan is real. Recognition is kind of a difficult thing for us. We don't perceive something or don't understand something. We can be be really confused. And yet right here in verse 3 and 4, Paul wants to remind us, look there, even if our gospel is veiled, verse 3, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is God's image. My friends, spiritual realities are profound. Satan... The devil moves kind of momentarily on the center stage here in Paul's uh, letter. Now, it's kind of a, a challenge for us to get our minds around because most of us aren't thinking really about Satan, about the demonic realm, about spiritual realm, and yet the spiritual realm exists. I don't know if you've thought about this recently, but we live primarily in a spiritual reality. And so demons angels, non-corporeal beings exist. Actually, right now, angels here, demons potentially here. Because Satan is real, the spiritual realm is real. And so we, as, as Americans, particularly as Westerners, we are tempted to think of Satan in the demonic realm as kind of like a children's storybook myth or Hollywood horror or superstition. And yet, the words of Jesus himself Warn us to be, to be wary of that sly old fox of Satan. And realize, my friends, that Satan, in his power, has been given a certain amount of ability. And it's a frightening ability. And if we're not wary, we can be duped or deceived. Paul here calls Satan, in verse, in verse 3 or verse 4, he calls him the, the God of this world. John 12, 31 calls him the, the ruler of this realm. Ephesians 2 calls him the prince of the power of the air. And here we see that Satan's ability is to blind people, that he has bound people up and he has veiled their eyes. He keeps them from seeing something. Now we recognize this is not a physical blindness necessarily. These are people who have eyes, these people who can see, but they seeing don't behold. They don't understand what they're seeing. They don't recognize what they're seeing. And so Satan has the ability to blind people, to keep a veil over their eyes. And if you don't remember what it's like to be blinded or veiled, just think back a few years ago, perhaps before you became a follower of Jesus. You also were blinded. I also was veiled. I could not see. I could not behold. Because I also was blinded by Satan himself. Now this is a dire blindness. This is a grievous situation. This is heavy and weighty. And we need need to sit here and to think about it. Lest we go back to that that mythology, that children's storybook kind kind of idea. No, no, no. Satan is real and he hates Jesus Christ. He wants to do everything he can to keep you and I from beholding him. He wants to keep everything he can. He wants to do everything he can to keep men and women in the in Dubai, United Arab Emirates, or in Lucknow, India, from understanding and comprehending how beautiful and glorious Jesus Christ is. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul says that Satan has devious schemes. He wants to outwit us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul calls him a phenomenally successful liar. Satan is good at lying. Have you ever met a good liar? I mean, someone really skilled at it? It takes you about like two minutes, and then you realize you can't trust a word they say. Satan is the father of lies the first and the best. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 7 and 8, up to verse 14, Paul calls him an angel of light. He disguises himself. 
He presents as good, as beautiful, even as glorious and powerful. Why? So that he might deceive us. And who is Paul writing to here in the, in the book of Corinthians? He's writing a church. He's writing to a group of Christians, people like you and me, because Paul is concerned that perhaps some of them have been deceived. It is possible, brothers and sisters, that you and I could be deceived by Satan. I don't want to be deceived. How about you? Oh, no, no. I want to recognize that Satan is real. And Paul wants us to recognize that the blindness that unbelievers experience, that that non-Christians have toward Jesus Christ, that it actually is by the power of Satan. And we ourselves want to recognize that lest we lose hope. We also want to recognize that so that we might be aware. And recognizing that, begin to develop weapons of warfare like Paul talks about in Ephesians 6, where we recognize that our warfare is not particularly against other humans, but against the spiritual powers of darkness, that we might be ready. I just wonder, Grace Bible, are you ready? Are you ready for this spiritual battle? Because you're already in it. You're already engulfed in it. Imagine someone who's been deployed to some military um, institution, to, to some battlefield, and they are not prepared. They do not have any weapons. You would grieve for them. You would wonder, how did they get there? You and I, we're already deployed. We are already on the battlefield. Yes, Jesus Christ is with us. Yes, he's given us his spirit. Yes, he's given us his word. Do you know it? Are you engaged in the battle by faith? Or have you perhaps become dull to the power of our enemy? It's important to see here in in verses 3 and 4 what Satan has blinded people to. It's not just that they're blind, but what they are blinded to, I think it gives us, a, a, it opens up maybe a little window on what is the heart of, of Christianity? What is the heart of the gospel? What is the center of every church? Because Satan, his, his anger, his malice toward, toward God and toward us, it centers on one particular thing. And you see it there in the, in the text. He keeps them from seeing the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is God's image. Satan wants to keep us from seeing Jesus Christ. So it's not just some cultural phenomenon. It's just a, not just a style of music. It's not just some kind of political view or economic view about socialism or capitalism. It's, it's not just some idea about what so, uh, social group that we're in. It's not your job, your vocation. It's not your family practice or the way that you desire to lead your, your, your family. There's one very central, very fundamental thing that, that Satan wants to keep us from seeing and, and unbelievers from seeing, and that is... Jesus Christ's glory. He is happy if we don't see that. And so I want to do everything I can, and you want to do everything you can to see Christ, to make him shine, that others might see him, that others might make him shine. This is not primarily an American issue or an Indian issue or an Emirati issue. It is a human issue that we do not see as we ought but I want to see him, Jesus Christ, born of woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who are under the law. I want to see him who for our sake was made sin so that we might be the righteousness of God. I want to see Jesus Christ who is now risen, exalted to heaven, and who rules heaven and earth as Lord of all. I want to see him. For my friends, there really is no one else like him. In heaven or on earth or under earth, there is no other name like his. There is no one who compares with Jesus Christ. And I just wonder, are you in love with him? Have you seen him as he is? Because I promise you, if you could behold Jesus for one moment, you would see that he is better. He is better than anything you can imagine in this world. He is better than the the highest joy, than the greatest pleasure that you could find. 
Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior. And yet Satan has blinded them. He, he veils them. They cannot see. And even now, I just it, it always strikes me as I think about this passage, as I think about North India, the state that we are in, uh, Uttar Pradesh, is the same size as Oregon, give or take a, a few kilometers. It's the same size. Uttar Pradesh has 220 million people. Oregon has how many? Five, six. And so it strikes me who in Uttar Pradesh right now is worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ? It's very few. How will they believe? How will they understand? How will they turn and see that Jesus Christ is better? How will that veil be removed? How can they be rescued? Look there at verse 6 with me. Because if it were not for verse, you know, passages like verse 6, if it were not for um, even this whole passage, I would lose hope. I would despair. And perhaps you would too. And yet, in verse 6, I, I can see where my hope is. I can see that there is life in the midst of this great burden. Here Paul says, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Here we see Paul hearkens all the way back to creation, to the very first day of creation, to the very first words that God spoke. And he reminds us, he reminds us that, that in a sense, though people are veiled and blinded by Satan, there is one who is far greater than Satan. There is one who has exceedingly more power than Satan. That is God the Creator. God the Creator on day one says, let light shine. And what happens? In the darkness, over that unformed mass, light comes. Just by His mere word, God speaks and light comes into being, comes into existence. Paul takes us all the way back to day one to see the glorious power of God. And not only does he do that, not only does he take us back to God shining, God speaking light into darkness of, of day one of creation, but then he kind of mysteriously pulls this into our own hearts. I don't know if you saw that there, but look back. He says, God who let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts. So that creative power that God has to bring light into darkness also shines into my heart and into your heart to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of Jesus. And so it is not really about us at all in the end. It's not about me being good enough or smart enough or good-looking enough to be able to go to Dubai and convince people about Jesus Christ. No, 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 no. It's me shining Jesus Christ. And as people see Jesus Christ in me, they begin to hear and see and understand that Jesus Christ is Lord and supreme. And so those eyes that are veiled, as someone turns to Christ, the veil is removed. And you even see that back in chapter 3. Look there. In chapter 3, verse 14. How is that veil removed? How is it removed for me or for you? Paul says their minds were hardened, speaking of the Israelites, for to this day when they read the old covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But, verse 16, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. What kind of freedom? Freedom from the veil. Freedom to see. Freedom to behold Jesus Christ and to love Him and to know Him. It reminds me of a guy named Prem Prakash in uh, Lucknow or near Lucknow. Prem about 10 years ago was working a small family business in a relatively nondescript Indian city. And as he was working there, some neighbors in a, in a neighboring village came and said, hey, we want to get together with you. We want to talk about, with you about something really important. And Prem thought, 
It's a good Hindu boy thought, you might think. Hey, this is great. I'll get a good business connection. Maybe they'll give me like a, a, new, a new kind of factory or a new way to make some money. And these guys came to his house, and they did a Bible study with him. And they started telling him about Jesus, and they gave him a book. Well, Pray was not a reader. He, does not, he did not like reading. And yet, he found himself drawn to this book that this guy had given him. And so he starts reading the book, all the while still thinking, ah, they're going to come and, and help me get a good job, help me open up my, expand my factory, make a little more money. And so the, the, that family or that group kept going back to Prem's house week in and week out for like six months. Each week, they'd give him a, a new chapter of the Bible. And each week, he would read it. And yet he says that over the course of those months, he began to care less and less about about that factory, less and less about the new marketing scheme, less and less about are they going to help me make connections for my business, and more and more he began to be drawn to this mysterious, beautiful image of Jesus Christ in, in Scripture. And it got to the point where he would, he would finish the chapter, he'd call them up and say, hey, I already finished that, can you give me more? Can you give me more? And even the, even the men who were giving this to him were saying, man, most people just do not read and this guy's reading it, not just reading it, but understanding it. Not just understanding it, but he wants more and more. And praying over the course of these six months turned to Jesus Christ. And whereas before he thought of Jesus as just one of many gods, over the course of that year, he turned to the Lord Jesus. That veil was removed. He became a disciple and now, 10 years later, he's one of the students at the seminary at Zion in Lucknow. And now he is teaching and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to others. His life has been completely transformed, just like our lives have been transformed by the gospel of grace, by the gospel of mercy. Because at some point, all of us were blind. And God came and opened our eyes. God removed the veil as we turned to Christ. He gave us new affections, new desires. And we love Him, do we not? Do we have new desires, new affections that we, we turn to and we give to Him our, our life? And yet, at the same time, we know, we already talked about that short term memory loss, we know that we forget. We know that, that many days we wake up and, and our thoughts still circle ourselves. And so today, today we, we remember that Jesus Christ has shown in our hearts, or God has spoken in our hearts to give the light of the glory of the gospel in the face of Jesus Christ. We remember that it's really not about us. We remember that it's, it really is about God working through us and in us for his own glory. We remember that though we were broken and are broken, God loves us. He really does love us. And he desires that we as his disciples would, would make more disciples. The whole thing here, friends, is we desire Christ to shine through us. We desire that as God the creator let light shine out of darkness and is shining in our hearts. We, we, want, we want to do things and say things and create habits in our lives, in our families' lives, that make Christ shine, that radiate Jesus. And so I just wonder, young men, young women, are you radiating Christ in the choices that you make? Are you, ra are you shining Christ forth in the decision, decisions that you make for your family? I just wonder, the, the, the lies of American self-fulfillment are so subtle. Whether it's our own sin or the schemes of the world or, or Satan himself, we have so many things that detract our attention from a single devotion to Jesus Christ. Paul knew that 2,000 years ago. We know that today. So I wonder, grandparents, do your grandchildren know that at the center, the core of your life, there's only one name. There's only one thing. There's only one person, Jesus Christ. Because your grandkids are not just going to absorb it by being around you. They need to hear it. They need to hear your testimony. They need to hear how you were broken and how God saved you by his grace. Husbands, 
Do you lead your family in discussion over God, God's word? I don't mean just listening to a message kind of passively like some of you perhaps are doing right now, but rather that we would work with one another and talk with our wives and our children about what are we learning? How has God changed us? For I promise you, you do not drift into holiness and understanding and faith. We drift away from Christ. And so, friends, as long as the day is today, shine forth Jesus Christ. Remember mercy. Renounce and refuse. Resist the ways of the world because they are subtle. Recognize that Satan is real and he wants to eat you for lunch. He wants to destroy you. And rest in God's supernatural work. Rest in his work because he who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown and is shining through you. Rest in his work as you proclaim Christ. And do it, my friends. Proclaim Christ. There's nothing else better. I promise you in 20 years, you will not look back on your life and say, oh my word, I wish I had fill in the blank. But you will look back perhaps and say, I wish I had spoken Christ a little bit more to my grandkids or to my wife or to my neighbors. And yet God enables it, does he not? He enables it. He loves us, he sees us, he knows us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you now in the name of Jesus Christ. We remember that we ourselves were once blind, veiled. We were dull to see, slow to hear, slow to see. Though we were far off, when we were far from you, Lord God, we remember that you came to us in Jesus. You opened our eyes that we may see him. You poured your love over us. And even now, Lord, we just praise you and thank you for your great love in Jesus. We thank you that, that you do love us, that we, you do know us. So, Father, even as we speak about being disciples of Jesus and following him and loving Christ, we just want to bask in your grace and your mercy because you are our Savior. You are our King. Oh, great God, I thank you that you have defeated Satan. I thank you that we need fear nothing from him. I thank you that we can look to him who has for our sake become king, Jesus Christ, and know that he rules this world. And yet, Father, even now I think about Dubai, I think of Lucknow, I think here of Bend, and so many individuals and families, so many people who have yet to call upon your name. Oh, gracious God, would you pour out your mercy? on them. Would you shine forth Jesus Christ through us that people might see Christ? Lord, yet not I, but Christ in us, we pray. Amen.